Hey, Tim. Hey, Ryan. And hey, everyone out there listening. Hey, that sounded very radio jog. Hey, everyone out there listening today. Welcome to Dismembering Horror, the podcast show where myself, Ryan McDuffie, and myself, Tim Aslan, sponsored by Comet. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we dismember a horror film for you. That's what we're doing here. And we hope on your end, too, you're dismembering it in ways that we aren't even. What does that even mean? Well, we talk about what worked for us, what did not work for us, and anything else we found interesting or noteworthy. Point being, we're talking about it thoroughly enough to be referred to as a dismemberment. And we're all doing it under the fun and guys of friends getting together, watching a horror film, and then just as I said, dismembering said horror film. Tim and I come at it from a filmmaker lens, both in the analytical meaning-making sense and in the uh, practical side, nuts and bolts filmmaking side too, creeps in. All And, you know, filmmaking is mostly everything in between those things. And here we are for... Episode 168, all set to dismember The Beast with Five Fingers from 1946. And for Tim and I, you're listening to this freshly. If you are listening to it freshly, it's more mid-November, something like that. But for us, we have just exited October. So Tim, I got to know, how was your whole Halloween season? And Halloween specifically, did you do anything special? Any highlights of horror movies you watched feel like even though we wrapped up our uh our you know episodes we were doing now we can fully reflect on the month itself which is fun to do since we are a horror podcast i went to a number of halloween event like uh i don't know what you call them haunted house haunted hayride um spooky whatever Things that were all fun and cool. The L.A. Haunted Hayride I've never been to. We did that. Um, Which is actually the Hayride part was the least exciting. (laughs) (laughs) They have these. um, They have a lot of stuff there. I was pretty impressed. Um, They had like concessions and a little gift shop. And the whole area is kind of decked out. It's like in Griffith Park. And there's three different haunted house things all very cool um the hayride was fine you know you stand in line for like an hour and a half for a thing that's like just it's cool i mean they put a lot into it but not particularly scary (laughs) and then uh we also went to this one way out in in a town called phelan which is like I think it's near Palmdale. I mean, it's just like in the middle of nowhere. It sounds like a scary town. (laughs) Yeah, it's the type of place that you're like, you get to and it's night and you go, oh, this isn't even a town. This is just like a weird desolate. You're driving on a like desert roads into (laughs) nothing. And (laughs) it was awesome. Definitely felt like the type of place that like you think you, you might not come back from. Right. It's got that Texas chainsaw sort of feeling to it. Middle of nowhere. Um, But that place was really cool. And they had a I think they had three little haunted house type things, too. And one of them had one of the more amazing effects that like broke our brains. You walk into a room and immediately it's it's fogged up. So there's low lying fog, so you can't see the floor. And you walk down a ramp. You probably walk down like, I don't know, two and a half, three feet or something like that. And you, you know, the ramp leads you into the corner of the room. So you have to turn to your left to look into the room. 
And suddenly a laser light turns on that is at your kind of waist level. And (laughs) there's a dude sitting in the middle of the room in a costume. But he's sitting at the level of the laser light. So he's just like, at first I thought, oh, he's on plexiglass. But then I see what you mean. Yeah. Right, like he's just hovering there, and I'm like, okay, the effect is he's on plexiglass, and we're going to have to, like, because of the fog and the laser, you can't see the the pedestal or whatever that he's on. Um, No, he just, like, stands up and walks across the room. And it was was scary, just as it was, (laughs) because it was weird, but it was so mind, like twisting because you're like this how the how is this happening and you realize that so the effect of the laser light that is skimming across the fog is creating a false surface right in and it's green and he's on stilts and he has false feet at the at the you know, well, it's actually his real feet on the stilts, but it's perfectly measured. So when he takes a step, you can't see the stilts because they're under the fog and they were black. But you can see his shoes walking across the false floor of the laser. And it, I mean, it is one of the best effects I've ever seen. I couldn't believe like my brain couldn't process it. And also that just the circumstances of your like, it's one of the first things you see when you enter into this big haunted house. It was so good. And, you know, the rest of it had also very cool stuff. But like, man, I've never seen an effect like that. And it was remarkably uh, effective. Cool. So if you're in the area, maybe that's one one that gets the sort of tidbit shout out in the know. Yeah, I'll look up what the name of that actually that one was. Um and uh, and maybe I'll, I'll post some pictures of it or something. Great. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you guys are doing that. That's fun. You're going to make it to Horror Nights, Halloween Horror Nights, one of these other years at Universal? We thought about it, um, but it's just timing wise it, our, with our schedule. Just, it just didn't work out. If um, um uh, my my tip for that one would be if you just are you know which I know you two are to get excited on the spooky season like go in September like right, closer right. to when it opens and it's cheaper yeah yeah and also Great. yeah weekdays were were very difficult for us just because of work but we would we were not going to go on a weekend just like not <laughs> worth it <laughs> it's too chaotic yeah um the 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 uh, the one in uh, Phelan is called Fear Farm so. Check it out cool. if you're ever in LA. Straight up Halloween. F- fear farm. I love it. <laughs> Great. How about well, you? Do you do anything? Uh, I mean, I was watching, except for I had to catch up on James Bond movies for the new one. I was just consistently defaulting to horror movies for this month, you know, yeah. which is fun. And that was also an excuse to kind of pull out the favorites or the classics. So, like, you know, I, I was going on how much I loved Old. That came out on Blu-ray. I had a lot of fun watching mm. that. And then um, and then out of, you know, what's ones from my stack, I didn't quite get to them all, but uh, re-watching Carnival of Souls, which we covered. Right. Like, man, I think we watched that, as, or we covered that as, like, episode 98 or 99 in our show. Um, but if it had, I had more time to sit on it, I sure, I'm sure it would have made my top 10 list. It was great. It's so good. It only grows on you. It's incredible. And then it was funny. I had a, a series of concerts I went to for the weekend that was dead, appropriately dead in company taking over the Hollywood Bowl. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I didn't really get my um, all my movie watching, you know, like I n- normally would do, which is fine. But it was funny. So The Beast with Five Fingers, I watched Saturday October 30th ended up being my last <laughs> movie of October. Cool. <laughs> it was like my big horror watch, which was kind of funny. Um, I mean, yeah, I won't go on about the concert. It's not film related, but it was, it was just funny as since it was a dead concert, it felt so like at home and normal to see all these like costumed people everywhere. And like even, even with the extra, how, you know, everyone was in costume. It was great. But it was so funny walking out of it and being like, oh, wait, 
it's Halloween and this is everywhere right now. It was just right. like a weird, <laughs> like the concert didn't leave you when you left. It was funny, but it was great. Well, that's good. Yeah. And now I'm just, you know, treating November as a continuation because I have a lot more I want to watch still <laughs> that I didn't quite yeah. get to. Endless. Yeah. yeah. But hey, all right. Beast with Five Fingers, 1946. How do we get into that? We get into that. With a trailer. So you ready for that trailer? Yes, I am. All right. I just said the title, but to say it again, Beast... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, we want to say who made this thing. All right. Yeah, with a screenplay by Kurt Siodmak and Harold Goldman based on The Beast with Five Fingers, a 1919 short story in the new Decameron by William Fryer Harvey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Coming out. Imagine, everyone, a hand coming out of a poster with scared faces next to it. Your flesh will creep at the hand that crawls, the beast with five fingers. A piano long silent mysteriously plays again. It's weird and ominous chords filling a bedeviled house with stark terror, a concerto of death, a cobra music of a dead man played by a hand that returned from the grave to wreak vengeance on his betrayers, marking each for murder as it strikes with inhuman power, a horrifying monster that takes its evil commands from beyond, that cannot return to the tomb till it completes its mission of destruction. Hillary, listen, listen. I can hear it, the piano, it's the hand playing, it's the hand. You were right all the time, it was Ingram's hand that committed murder. Found fingerprints of identical pattern in the library, in the hall, even on the window pane in your room, Signorina. You mean the same hand? I heard what they said in the garden. I couldn't help but hear. It's a lie. You are lying. I'm not a liar. But you, you are a coward. You don't want to hear the truth. Let's get away from here, Bruce. We're not under arrest. What can they do if we just disappear? I'm glad they really embraced the the hand theme in the the marketing there. A <laughs> hand comes out at the end and points at you. Don't you dare miss it. <laughs> like does a little like finger point. Hey, don't you dare miss it. And that hand will get you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tib. So after our trailer, we move on to our ratings per our rating system. Would we tell ourselves, talking to ourselves, to avoid this film, stream this film, rent this film, or buy this film? Um, I'd rent it. I'd rent it. Cool. It's not quite enough. Cl- like, it's close, but it's not quite, I-, I guess, iconic enough or something. There's something missing that we'll figure out. But uh, it's it's awesome. <laughs> like, so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. What what it is is awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was I was kind of my experience watching it was kind of wavering between a high stream it and low rent it. Uh, but in kind of thinking about it and reviewing it this morning, and just Peter Laurie's eyes. Yeah, I'll I'll side on a lower rent it. Yeah. Cool. Double rent. <laughs> All right. Yeah, a fun it's kind of like, you know, exactly under that tier of we have our sort of classic classics that everyone's kind of heard of or recognized and then whatever that next tier underneath of like if you're getting into it, what are the ones you should see? Like I'd put this one there. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. All right. Well then for our summary Tim, you know, I was thinking of you a lot during this was this one where it's like a mystery is afoot. We got our cast <laughs> of characters in a house. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love uh, for your rundown just to get us all on the same page, if you could, as if what what was this movie? What even happened? Well, Scoob and the gang get into the mystery mobile, mystery machine, whatever. <laughs> and they uh, they drive up to a mansion in Switzerland. And in that mansion, we have an old man in a wheelchair who can only use one arm for whatever reason. I'm sure he was uh, something. I'm sure they explained it, and I just wasn't paying attention. 
Uh, and he likes to play the piano, and he can do so because of the help of his somewhat sketchy friend who's a musician who's taught and re-composed um, a lot of classic music to be played with one hand. And it doesn't take place in 46, right? It takes place... It's set up. It takes place earlier. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. I think it's set up to be more like the twenties. Yeah, the short story came out in nineteen nineteen, but it's so funny because it's like forty six and anything before that. It like it looks like it could all be the same. To well, us. and it's also Europe, so we have like we have no point of reference, right? Um. Okay, so this old dude's got a kind of a a nurse who caretaker. Uh, hot, hot blonde, young, um, and the uh, the piano player, and that's so, and that's uh, Julie is yeah the nurse okay. is Julie Francis is the piano player, um, and who's the old guy? What's the old guy's name? Francis. No, that's the. Oh yeah, you're right. Sorry, the piano the old player guy is Francis, yeah. and Julie's the lady, and. Oh, yeah, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> what a name. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> you got Bruce. And then and then you've got this guy played by Peter Lorre. Hillary Cummings is his Cummins is his name. And he he's sort of like the resident. I don't know what his real position was, but he he's is, like it, he's the astrologist slash like resident secretary astrologist, I guess. Yeah, he's kind of studying his own stuff. They just kind of have him around to help out with things too, right? Um, so that's your people. There's also a lawyer, and who cares? Um, so really, the story is that Bruce, Bruce, and Julie kind of want to get out of town. Julie feels, you know, she's been working for this old dude forever and she feels like she can't leave. And the old dude is just acting weird. Um, he has them all over for dinner and he does this long protracted sort of song and dance about his uh, his mental state. If he's, you know, of sound mind and they are all like, yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> yes, you seem fine. <laughs> um. <laughs> And then he he makes them sign his will. He's made a new will, and we don't know what it says. And you uh, mentioned Bruce and Julie wanting to get out of town, but that's because they are in a secret tryst behind Francis's back, who's kind of just all in denial or is genuinely unaware of that uh, they got a thing going and he and Julie don't. Right? Yeah, but I mean, she's his nurse, so you know what I mean? It's not like she's there to be his wife. Right. No, no, I wasn't saying that, but he's... But he's smitten but he with her. he freaks out. Like, he's not aware that they're together and subsequently yeah. freaks out about it. And that's kind of that's kind of what ends up being his then downfall we'll get into here, right? Yeah, seemingly. Yeah. <laughs> downfall. Um, so... So, uh, he dies. <laughs> falls <laughs> he wakes down the, up in the middle of the night. He falls down the stairs when... In the greatest uh, stunt of all time. When he trying wheels to, his wheelchair down the stairs accidentally because he's freaked out. He's having a moment. He's having a little, like, uh, I don't know what you would call it, kind of a vertigo moment. He's and calling out for Julie. Help his me. piano is playing on its own. He's freaking and he falls down the stairs it, it, incredibly. It's such a good stunt. <laughs> and and he dies. And um they read the will and his, you know, he's got a couple dork relatives who show up thinking they're gonna inherit everything. <laughs> will says, No, no, sir, Bob. Everything goes to Julie. Everything. And now we get into a long <laughs> section of the movie that is quite literally just a debate over the legality of a will. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the best plot device, but here we are. Not very visual, right? Yeah. 
But what this does is that it sets this sort of the wheels in motion of who wants what and why. And we find out that Peter Lorre basically is like, this is all I have. These books that that my uh, boss had bought me over the years and Francis's relatives are like, you're a you're a mooch. I mean, we're going to take all your books away. We're going to take everything when we execute this will. And Julie is like, actually, since I'm getting the everything, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stick around just to sort of spite everybody instead of leaving with with uh, Bruce. And and then. Uh, the lawyer says, God, this is so dumb. The lawyer is like, hey, guys, just so you know, actually, this will might not really need to be the way it is. I could kind of just like write a letter saying that the old will prior to this one is the will that should be used. And that one said that you two dorks get everything. So like, we'll just do that. We'll take care of everything. It'll be great. Let me do it in the secret of night in the middle of the night. I'll do it. I'll write this note. And then he gets strangled to death by a hand. And then now we're in a movie. So the piano plays by itself. The lawyer gets strangled by a disembodied hand. The cops get called. There's a murder. So now it becomes a who done it and a why done it. And people start dropping like flies. People are getting strangled. Pianos are playing by themselves. Uh sir the uh the the staff is is freaked out they're leaving the mausoleum where francis is buried gets broken into there's a light on in the middle in the middle of the night there's a broken window that's only the size of a hand that can get through and in and out but it broke from the inside but the mausoleum was locked i mean it's great <laughs> everything about this whole section is awesome and then uh as as people begin to die or get injured P- we learned that Peter Lorre, Hillary, is kind of losing his losing his shit, and he's convinced that it's a disembodied hand. Nobody's really seen it. Um, the cop is, you know, fairly dubious of this idea, but he's going along. And ultimately, Peter Lorre th- believes that he has caught the hand. And we'll put an end to all of this. And he locks it in a safe and hammers it to a book and all this stuff. Right. Are you still with me? (laughs) Yes. Okay. So here's what actually was going on. Peter Lorre, out of his manic desire to not lose everything, constructed this idea. Whether or not he knows he constructed this is sort of up for debate. He it might be kind of a he might have just lost his mind. But he was killing everybody because he needed to pick them off so that they couldn't execute this will. But he also just lost his mind. And he used this hand idea as like I don't know, the solve to say it's not him, it's the hand. Um and uh, the the detective cop guy kind of figures it out, and uh, and that's it. Yep, the commissario, right? So, truly, truly, one of the better episodes of Scooby Doo I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and it didn't even sorely have Scooby-Doo. lacking in Scooby snacks. Yeah, <laughs> but but all in all, a pretty fun ride. Great. And thanks for taking us on that little ride, Tim. <laughs> so that way we're now we're all we're all caught up. We got an idea of it. Now we I think we can safely set off into our next section. What worked? What worked? What worked for you? What worked for you? It worked like a charm, Smith. <laughs> what worked? What worked? I guess I can kind of give, you know, more of an in-summary view up front. And this is one where it might be like a little hard to not 
save things for what did not work. But kind of like how you put it in your summary, you know, is this movie had ups and downs where I was kind of like really into it or I was kind of like, okay, there's the will and what, and, you know, just (laughs) figuring all that out. But I will say from the get-go, it started off strong with... uh, with introducing Bruce Conrad coming in and swindling the uh, a tourist couple. And it yeah. was just that kind of dialogue that's just so of its time and like charming and fun and like quippy and just silly. I don't know. It, it, it's, it just engages me in a way that you don't really, you know, can't really get anywhere else or is hard to do nowadays with it's like just this stupid little like joke that he makes that the woman laughs at and then like you know knowing the cafe is like oh no stay away from the salami i'd recommend the cheese oh we'll have a cheese sandwich then you know just so silly (laughs) um started off strong and then whenever that kind of spirit would come in throughout of just moments of dialogues it was it was clicking for me yeah um, I misspoke. It's not in Switzerland. It's in Italy, but I think it's the Alps. That's what was uh, the Italian Alps, not the mm. Swiss Alps. So whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they set him up and he seems pretty interesting and he kind of serves this. He serves this like grounding presence, um, role, uh, in spite of him being a swindler which I think is actually kind of a really smart thing to do. Um, You kind of make your grounding presence somewhat unreliable in a story like this, because it's all, it's all predicated on the unreliable nature of the actual villain. Like the truth is unreliable. Meaning like he's the one always saying from the get go, well, what's actually happened is none of this supernatural mumbo jumbo. It was this and this. So, but we're also doubting him. Don't know where he's coming from. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I think that's really smart. I just watched uh, my recommendation has a similar kind of, they use that tool to kind of make you go, well, what, like who should I believe actually? Um, <clears throat> So that's really smart. Peter Laurie's character is amazing. I mean, that dude is ridiculously good. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, let's just get that out of the way. Exactly. <laughs> he's just, in, he's an, in, I mean, or was an incredible actor. He's, you know what I, it made me watching him made me go, cause like film in particular, because it's such a historically short period of, of art, you can look at it all. You know what I mean? You can get a broad sort of overview of it and you can see the the recurring archetype casting that exists in in story in film because like, you know, it hasn't changed all that much. Now, certain little things have changed based on like the era that it exists in. But like Peter Laurie is Remy Malik, right? Like. They're basically the same type. Now, how we as a society view that type has changed slightly. Like we sympathize, I think, more with Remy Malik's version of this. But they're so the same kind of guy. And it just made me think like it's so interesting to watch these old movies and kind of look at the the we've talked about archetypes and whatever, but just the casting archetypes, you know, that like. Well, let's see, for example, uh, you know, Jimmy Stewart is the same as Jim Carrey, right? Like they're the same archetype. Uh, Clark Gable is the same as uh, uh, George Clooney. Uh, like we see these kind of they, they every every decade or so has their versions of these archetypes and they're not that different. Yes, over the point. Years. I I agree with the point. I'm just fixated on that one example of Jimmy Stewart and Jim Carrey. I don't know if I agree with that one. <laughs> I get what you mean, Bo. Like in casting and roles they've been in. Yes, um, this is where I always I have fun bringing in my um, Enneagram obsession because that's immediately oh, sure, how yeah. I put it. Because like as soon as you said Rami Malek and Peter Lorre, I like their Enneagram type combined with their physicality. Like that's yeah. that's what does it for me. And like, so as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see they're both 
this type kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And so what I'm kind of getting at and what works about this is that cinema as a fairly young art form, all told, has this kind of visual language in, in casting. I mean, it's a character language that we just get because we've like it's been embedded into the art form. And I think that what you know, <laughs> it makes it easier, even though there are some aspects of this movie that are a little whatever. When you have these archetypes and you have the people who made those archetypes shine in those roles, like you kind of who cares that the movie gets boring? It's like, dude, just watching him freak out is so exciting because yeah. he's so good. What about Jimmy Stewart, Tom Hanks? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You see that? All right. Yeah. No. And then I guess to go off what you just said. Uh, I mean, that was my, yeah, that's the, my favorite stuff in this movie is that last half hour chunk where we're just kind of going between Peter Lorre freaking out, seeing what he's seeing at this point. We don't know if it's real or not, or what's going on. Um, and then, you know, it's just for whatever reason, everyone else just isn't in the room. So it's just this sort of like sequence. He has a freak out interaction with the hand. It attacks him, whatever. He <laughs> screams about it. They all aren't sure what to make of it. And then, then you know, it kind of settles down again and then it happens again. But just all that, all that was so great. Yeah. And just just the general environment and setting and and like just feel of where we are and what's going on yeah all being it's, at the same house right it's i don't know would you call it's gothic feeling um it just feels like a classic that's why we keep saying scooby-doo it's just all in one house it has this classic mystery kind yeah. of almost sherlock holmes feel to it with right, the sort of right. you know set cast of characters that we kind of get to know and in their interrelations yeah yeah, I mean it's all uh, it's all of the things that ended up in the either satire or homage versions of these stories, right? Like it's Clue, it's Scooby Doo, uh, it's Sherlock Holmes. Like it's all of those things. So it's just it's cool, and it and it does work very well. Like it's creepy, you know. There yeah. are, there are a bunch of moments in this where I was like, man, they're especially with camera movement they kind of pull you around rooms. So it, it, whereas I think in this era and maybe a little before this era too, you got bogged down, I think in the stylistic filmmaking, a lot of the time of just like a camera on sticks in a room with like two, like a master shot. And maybe you got to punch in to a two shot a couple of times. And it was like, it just when these dialogue scenes go on, you just go, "Oh my god, I'm gonna kill myself." They're so kind of like, boring, especially the early '30s ones. Yeah, exactly. And but there are just exceptions totally... to that, of course. We've pointed out, yes. yeah, yeah. I mean, the Black Cat, for example. But M, yeah, M. It's so it just this is refreshing, even though it does suffer from this slog of of I don't know, just plot. You still are getting these really, really nice uh setups right like visual setups and camera moves and like compositional things that are just at least something to hang on to there's that one that was cool where like the th their three faces all looking the same direction at the same time side by side that was neat and then just i mean aside from the comp composition the just the lighting the classic like there's always shadows somewhere in this house being yeah. projected onto someone it's really nice there's also, I mean, legitimate crane shots, like mm -hmm. big moves from like the, you know, the close up of the people in the room by the fireplace and pulling all the way back and out and up to look down on the, the, just the magnitude of the, the hall that they're in. And so stuff like that just makes it much, much more big of a movie. And I think it's smart, right? Because you are just in kind of one location the whole time, but they take advantage of everything they can to make you feel like there's a sense of scope and scale of just this place that we're in. And it feels 
ominous and and creepy and dark and all of the things that you want a, a movie like this to feel like. I mean, it's a location where it's normal for them just to say, oh, hey, look, the mausoleum in the backyard has a light on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's so cool. And then, you know, of course, I mean, that's why I say Scooby-Doo, because it just, it has all the things that Scooby-Doo used. It's got a secret safe behind the bookshelf. Um, You know, it's got a giant fireplace. It's got a hidden phonograph inside of a suit of armor. Like, that is so cool. And so all of those things, just like the construction of this environment, was awesome to me. Speaking of the hidden phonograph, that was part of our our big reveal at the end for what was actually going on. Like we said in the summary, you know, it was all Peter Lorre. What's his name? He's just Peter Lorre. Hillary. Hillary. <laughs> Which is also a memorable name. Hillary Cummins. Um That uh, it's all just him going crazy. And Tim, you know, that's like a fine line whether or not that works for me or not. Because I always prefer when it lands on the supernatural. But this one absolutely worked for me. uh, Because like all you were saying, you know, when it's a Scooby-Doo story, yeah, you are going to have it. So they pull the mask off at the end, you know, and it works in that sense. But then also just combined with the fact that it was him and like, it doesn't change the fact that he was going crazy um, totally. <laughs> and just getting to, to witness that. Um, and it was done so well where it like so much of the little details of the setup, you're really going like, wait, how could this even be faked? Like it really does feel like a genuine mystery you get caught up into. Um, that then well, there are definitely things that they don't quite explain either, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, because there are all these instances of, uh, or maybe not all these instances, but like there's the, was it the lawyer dude who like is backing up, like a hand's coming at him who gets killed and they all hear the piano playing. And then, um, oh, and then like someone else dies and they go, uh, the hand strangled him. I saw it with my own eyes. You know, there's... I don't know. It seems consistent that it is going to be the hand. So, right. Um, which I'll make it work. Um, the, the fingerprints are a little bit like the whole justification that it couldn't have been anybody in the house, that it had to be the hand kind of falls apart unless Peter Lorre <laughs> was physically holding the hand and strangling people with the hand that he cut off of the, the old dude. Like, you know what I mean? So like there's, there are some plot holes, but it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> well, what what's working aside from just the little details, I think, so well, is the story, character story going on itself with him going crazy and, yeah. you know, what's going on with everyone. But for him specifically, I kind of realized, like, you remember the moment towards the beginning that's kind of the setup before... Um, Francis Ingram, the the crazy the pianist whose house this is, whose hand it presumably is before he right. passes away. We have this intense moment where he strangles Hillary. That's uh, right. Pr- yeah. Pretty brutally. It's like, you know, and a big deal is made out of it. You know, they're checking up with him, there's blood left on it. So when you look at it as like this was a traumatic crazy, you know, thing that happened an attack that happened on him right before he died, it sort of works as like a continuation of that act against him. You know, when you don't look at it as just some sort of random one-off attack, you know, it was a hand strangling him, leaving its imprint. So when set yeah. up that way, it it works when you're kind of looking at it from Hillary's perspective. Yeah, because they also sort they really do lean in on when we meet him that he's he's not overtly doing well. <laughs> no, he's obsessed he's, with this astro- astrology. Like, right. oh, I'm, I'm going to find out the day you die. Yeah, he seems pretty on the edge of unhinged already, and. It may it sort of all makes sense in the end to be like, okay, that I get it. He <laughs> was already an unstable dude. He this is the only thing he has. And then 
you know, the, well, it wouldn't be the hand that feeds him. Yeah, well, the hand that feeds him bites him. And yeah. you can kind of see that triggering just like a cascade of of delusion of like he has to justify all these things because that person not only shouldn't have done that because that was his his one his benefactor i guess and you know there's sort of a betrayal built into that that moment of getting strangled right and then it culminates with uh like to play on that phrase burning the hand that feeds him <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly. So just I love his spiral into delusion. Yeah. It's so cool because we until we know, we don't know that it's a delusion. We get clues and stuff and that's cool. But like until we're actually told that he's just lost it, we get to sort of experience what he's experiencing in his delusion. And I think that's kind of the bread and butter of how you make the crazy person work because it's, it's not just, Oh, he's crazy and unhinged and whatever it's, we are experiencing what he's experiencing. And that's kind of why I liked, you know, let's uh, scare Jessica to death too, is because we're experiencing her, well, in that case, her possible delusion on un, un, uh, unconfirmed with her. And so we're it's not it's not trite. It just is what we're experiencing. And I think that connects us to that and makes it fun. Tim, Without I, that, you just go, you know, oh, he sucks. <laughs> I'm realizing we uh, the most similar film, I think that we've covered to this. Do you remember what we did for episode 23 of our show? Jesus, 23. That was like three <laughs> years ago. Um, I'm God. just going to tell you, Arnold. Look, Arnold. 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 <laughs> oh, no. I had tried. Thank you very much for reminding me. I've tried to block this out. <laughs> but right. You, Peter. Everyone, uh, everyone gathers after the deaths of someone, and there's a will involved, and we wondering if he's still a ghost or alive or not, causing right. all this stuff. And it's in a big house with a mausoleum. It's it's very. Similar. I feel like Arnold was. I I don't remember if this is true, but one of the movies we watched, maybe it was Arnold, was was written by one of the guys who also wrote on Scooby Doo. I think that might have been Arnold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Okay, well, just to wrap up the, or yeah, just continue, maybe wrap up um, Hillary Cummins going crazy and seeing the hand and all that. I just got to get out of the way. Not a lot to say on it, but just the effects of the hand that he's seeing, so that we're seeing. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's I guess combines kind of whatever they were doing on the Invisible Man at some points, yep. but then also just this incredible, like, hiding stuff in shadows or clothing like a hidden arm and having you know an extension of a of a wrist that's cut off that looks absolutely flawless is so fun to look at it's, when it's playing the piano we didn't even mention i mean we mentioned you know it has the fake uh wax cylinder that's playing the piano music back but just when setting up you know all that's giving it that overall feel i mean we have piano theme being played consistently at night and then visuals of a disembodied hand playing that piano I mean, right. come on <laughs> no it's really cool and I, you know this is not the podcast to sort of break down how they did that but if you want to go down that rabbit hole at least to see sort of like how the invisible man was done which i you know i assume this had very very similar if not the same kind of technology being used um there's a cool youtube channel uh called corridor crew and they're v they're vfx guys and they just they break down vfx from all sorts of different things but they do cover the invisible man at one point and that episode's really fun but it's amazingly simple and complex how they were doing this stuff back in the day um it's super cool you're essentially, in the most basic terms, you're 
doing kind of what you would expect. You're shooting it twice, one time with the subject, like the person whose hand it actually is, and then from the wrist up there in usually in black at this time time. Um, so what you don't want to see is black. And then they are quite literally painting that out of the each frame of film and putting it over the same shot that's shot a second time. And that's hard. <laughs> I mean, it's original rotoscoping, right? Like it is crazy. To think about the amount of time that goes into to accomplishing that kind of thing. And they've got, you know, there's a fair amount of disembodied hand in this. Yeah. That's articulated, right? It's I, an actual person's hand. Rather than the the rubber hand that they use in some scenes, which is quite funny. And like watching Peter Lorre do things with the rubber hand to make it kind of look like it's moving on its own is so much fun. <laughs> it's just awesome. Yeah, it made me think. I mean, I was just thinking of you and uh, Evil Dead Two would make a great double screening with that. Oh, man, <laughs> the best. Um, okay, well, so we have you know Hillary's story going on. We kind of covered here, but kind of like why you know I pointed out in the summary. It sounds like maybe you glossed over it more, didn't attach to it as much. But I really see this as the story, which I love. This is like remember the black cat was, you know, we have um, about crazed guy literally preserving women in, like, right. glass tombs for his collection and, like, and then is holding on to, like, a drugged out, uh, the daughter of his old nemesis, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> but just yeah. stories that are, like, the old man to their own detriment, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, being obsessed with a singular woman as kind of like their one, like the one thing in the world that is, you know, worth living for, or, you know, this, th whatever that is. And then that then being their downfall. I mean, that's what his story was. And that's why I point out, you know, of course, there wasn't, it was all, I guess, one sided or whatever, nothing actually to it. Um, but but they point out like oh you can't let you can't let old man you know Ingram know about about you too because he's gonna go crazy you know if he does there's that obsessiveness angle to it and like yeah. right before he falls down the stairs you know he's got he's he's yeah it's like wavy vision or whatever it's really fun but when he's calling out for uh, Julie he's not just doing it because he needs his nurse he's like calling her out her name like she's the one kind of you know bright light savior for him in this world and i mean and it's built into the story too with the will and everything you know just leave everything to her and then but then with that too that sort of i don't know it's it's not it's like denial on some maybe subconscious level he doesn't want to confront, but it's also just this sad obliviousness of like, no, dude, she's like, she's clearly with this other guy. Like, what are you even doing? Right. Why, like, he could leave her all the money and it'd be fine. He should just be supportive and open. Like, I want the best in the world for you. Great. You two live your happy life. You're a great, I love you. You're a nurse for me. But no, I mean, so that it's all kind of, that's our our thematic jumping off point and kind of trickle out effect of this whole, you know, one person's fatal flaw that then that then sort of sows the seeds for everything else and sort of uh, puts a thematic lens over it all. I, I'm always a sucker for all that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, it's old man spite, right? Mm -hmm. That's just what it is. And that's... <laughs> sadly i guess a pretty common thing or just or a thing that we all know citizen kane kind of too yeah right like where people you know you get to a place where you're just like bitter and angry about everything so you just want to piss on it all mm -hmm. and you want what you want even though you probably know that you either can't or shouldn't have that thing right so there becomes this like rich old rich guy can't lived a life where they could just buy whatever they want but you can't buy people well you could probably at this point but not exactly right like you shouldn't you can't 
people have free will. You, you know, you don't own them. Um, and that, I think that theme of like, I want what I want is carried through to, uh, Hillary's character of, of just like, when you start to get into that obsessive, you know, I deserve this or I own this or whatever you want to call that kind of egocentrism. It's all about you. That's everybody's downfall, right? It's also Ingram's family's downfall. They show up being like, well, we deserve his fortune. Why? Right. You didn't do anything like you weren't around. It's like you you just showed up when he died. And they pay the price for that, right? So the attitude of ownership or presumed ownership is everybody's downfall. Well, and it's also could be, you know, looked at another um, kind of similarly to Hillary's story of questioning one's own sanity and how old man Ingram's using his wealth and power to almost double down on his own insanity. Like that, see, that extended scene you described where he literally gathers everyone together to be like, I need you all to um, assure me I'm not crazy. I'm of sound mind. But that in its own way, it's basically like it's, it's as if he's twisting that in his own meaning to mean that, um, Oh, there's no way that Bruce and Julie are together. You know, that he couldn't be wrong or or mis misreading any situation like how he's basically double getting using his cl- power t- to get the group to help double down on w- however he's seeing the situation which is him at the center of it all and how he sees it is exactly how it is right <laughs> yeah i mean i guess you could kind of say at its core, it's all greed based, right? Everybody's the people who are exhibiting greed or a version of that, uh, proprietary greed, <laughs> maybe are the ones who, who suffer for it. Cause like even the lawyer, right? The lawyer yeah. is sort of like, well, whatever, whatever's good for me, I'll go with. And then he gets killed. So <laughs> right. they do, they do a really good job of just being consistent with that undercurrent. And I try to think of, you know, a moment I loved and how it applies to it all. You know, I try to think of that. Um, the right after he dies, how we have like, they're the, I don't know if they're literally hired or not, but we have the mourners slash howlers, <laughs> as they put it, yeah. like show up after he dies that are outside. We don't even see them, but we just hear outside this like, this group. It's like, um, like a like mournful carolers almost they're just moaning right. oh, ha, ha, just not you know just just constant and the one guy explains the other one well he was very respected in this community and da 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 blah blah blah, blah. so you know and sends them off but i don't know that was i don't know just that that ties to it all and his own his own issues in some way that i thought was interesting of like I don't know, because when you look at characters like that, these you, oh, old, bitter men, I mean, Scrooge, the classic example, right? Mm-hmm. And again, they all have their rosebud, whether it's, you know, it's person, sled, <laughs> whatever. Um, but you look at what their issue is, it's like they there's no kind of, um, you know, back back then especially, it's like there's no healthy way, or the side, there, there's... The, there's no like societally presented way for them to um, to share their emotionality, you know, mm, consistently mm-hmm. in any kind of way. You know, that wasn't associated with being a man. Like we all know that. That's um, so in the way that this is just all stories of that. But I don't know. I just I just think it's interesting that then these kind of stories say, well, the result of of burying all that or whatever, not having an outlet for that. It's like it all comes out with like one person, memory, object or whatever, like as if (laughs) as if that's a healthy use or a normal use to put that emotionality is it just gets all funneled into like one one thing, idea, person, whatever. And somehow the mourners, howlers, they just they somehow reflect that or play on that for me in a way. Yeah. Well, it's all kind of rooted in this this framework of of delusion 
because, you know, who <laughs> hiring professional mourners? <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, is is kind of a delusional thing to do. Like you, it's your you're creating the optics of a thing that doesn't actually exist. That was reminds me of the Nathan for you where he's pitching to a, a funeral home like that exactly, like hire, hire actors to come to a funeral. <laughs> so, so messed up. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's cool, right? Like that's all the people who bottle this stuff in it comes out in sort of a version of delusion. And that is the thing that like gets them in the end. So greed, greed leads to delusion is kind of a, a thing that you see in this, I guess. Yeah. Or a concentrated unhealthy form of that, like emotionality, you know, right. it's like getting funneled and yep. like coming out in a way that's just like, yeah, you know, yeah. You know. Not good all around. Yeah. Um, a couple other things, just like from a um, interesting casting character kind of point of view. I, I think, you know, the woman who played Julie felt really authentic and like not. She just felt like a person, which I feel like for this era was not always that common. <laughs> yeah. Which is a good. I, I don't know if that if that's rude to say or like I'm not trying to disparage other actors of the era, but I think that the way that male dominated directing and studios viewed women always two dimensionalized them, not always, but often. And in this one, I felt like that wasn't happening as much. Um, yeah, you always like got. She's a got some agency, and she's she's not just sort of like oh, about yeah. everything. Like, however, the circumstances played out to allow that, we don't know. But great. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've. I mean, I didn't recognize her, but I found her much more interesting than most. Well, not most, but uh, some of the the people you see in that era um, in similar roles, and. Um, just if we're on casting here, got to shout out J. Carol Naish, Naish as Commissario Ovidio Castaño. Like talking about bringing a Scooby Doo mystery vibe to it all. Like you got to so have good. the detective commissary character. Um, and yeah, he's just so much fun. I mean, Tim, I'm putting this in what worked. And I don't know if it was because I was just. Well, it's yeah, it's the kind of thing that would tickle me independently of what you might think of it. But just imagining like maybe you liked it, but just imagining you being like, oh, my God, and like rolling your eyes at the ending when he like speaks to camera. Do you remember <laughs> <laughs> where he's like totally playing for the audience of, uh, you know, that's ridiculous. A, a hand that moves and then, you know, his own hand comes up out of shot and this sort of like kitschy music is playing. I just was getting like such a kick out of that. Like he scares like, himself. Yeah. <laughs> like where else could you do? I mean, so of its time maybe is why I love it so much. And just that it was that actor just doing it. Like, I don't know that they could pull it off back then and did for I me. I think it's just perfectly fits in with his character. And so yeah. you just kind of go, yeah, that that makes that that seems about right for him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but including breaking the fourth wall, <laughs> you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. kind of. Well, you know why is because he that character is. Is a holdover from sort of a vaudeville type thing. Um. I'm not, I wish I knew more about sort of the the actual breakdown of um, all of the vaudevillian characters, but I'm, I'm not. But, you know, it has that feel. He's, he's, he's borderline a clown, but he's the clown in a position of power. Um, and so, like, he's there for comic relief and he's there for driving the story forward a little bit. And, you know, I... 
I'm totally fine with him being a kind of a character. Yeah, and the detective character is always sort of the uh, who the audience is hanging their hat on trying to associate, identify with as they're trying to figure it all out. Yeah, it's cool. I, I'm into it. Great. I wish that this movie just, well, I guess I should save that. Never mind. Well, then, does that mean you're ready for our next section? Did I mention how good the stunt rolling down the stairs is? Yes, but you did not mention it again, so. Well, let me tell you. That stunt is exceptional. (laughs) From all aspects. The setup is really good. The visual setup, the and, and just the story setup. But the camera angle that they use that we're super high up so we really feel because there's two ways to do it right and they kind of do both you set up the height of it by looking down like we go oh that's where he's headed if he falls but we in camera see him <laughs> roll down the stairs and tumble it's so good and then they do the other shot which is sort of the classic bottom of the stairs shot now often we see that bottom of the stairs shot first so that we go oh no he's gonna fall into camera or whatever but it doesn't matter. It's so, so well done. The stunt itself, that dude looked like he really took one. And it's all in camera. There's like no cutaway. It's just him. It's so seamless and natural. It's very easy to take for granted. Yeah. Stunt actors need more something. I don't know what it is. Credit? I, I don't know. No, we should just Praise. have stunts should have been through all of the history of the Academy Awards been a category. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's crazy, right? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Anyway, Uh, so (laughs) just props to whoever did that because it's amazing. And the construction of the stunt is just, (laughs) it's so wild. If we can, Tim, let's figure out uh, who that stunt person was, how they did it, and maybe they're buried over in Hollywood forever. We can go pay our respects. That's true. I mean, maybe we could figure out, yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll do some digging. <laughs> All right. Now I think with that, then it sounds like we're ready for our next section. What did not work? It's not ready yet. Seems to work okay. No, something important's missing. What did not work? <laughs> This is probably just a product of the era and how it's not really a consideration, I think. But the way the script is constructed in that, I guess it would be sort of the, it's really the first half of the second act. It's so boring, just talking about wills and like executions of Mm -hmm. wills and like you know you can legally change it because of this and we can write it it's just like shut up (laughs) you don't need any of that you just jump to the part where they're doing that thing whatever that is like i i get there's it's it maybe it's just a product of in that era, you felt like you needed to kind of lead the audience along more because it's such a new art form. It's only been around for a couple decades, really, in in a mass way. I guess. I, I don't know. I just it's it's annoying to me that that it it's both expositionally unnecessary and padded out unnecessarily. For what? I mean, if you if you took all of that out, what what do you lose? Fifteen minutes of the of the script of the runtime, okay? Like you've got lots to work with. Yeah, that would that running time would have felt much more appropriate. So I just it it annoys me that I don't know. There's nothing you can do about it, really. I I, I don't know. <sighs> It just, I think you just kind of have to swallow it. But it ultimately is the thing for me that just really, really deflates the movie from a potential buy. Um, and that's too bad. Yeah, I know if that stuff could just be cut down a little bit. It's weird because I agree. 
Um, and then I also agreed with what you said earlier, but you know about how all, all these really great shots and lighting, da 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 da. But I don't know how much of it was when I was getting, you know, I said from up front, this movie had high highs and low lows and kind of that scene, you know, that that section you described is exactly what I'm talking about. But I would kind of apply that too to just a lot of the setup, like the first half, you know, in itself, just within it all, you know, had those same ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So then I just kept thinking, I don't know. And I, I was... And some of how all that was shot and kind of what you're describing, it was shot. There was just nothing to it, didn't offer a lot. And I'm like, well, is that just an accurate representation of these scenes where not much is happening? I don't know. Either way, though, um, yeah, I feel you. And I was just trying to get a little more specific of how shooting it may or may not have played into that. Well, I mean, they're not lacking on the technical side of shooting. And the whole movie really is a, a creep fest, right? Like you, you have everything working. You have everything that can work to make a thing feel creepy, a story feel creepy, like at your disposal. So just why not just lean in on it? Yeah. Like trade some of this unnecessary talking for just eeriness and i get it it's just not that wasn't the way things were done so right you don't even have to i guess you could do those scenes in a more like okay how do we fit this into the overall eeriness but again just by cutting them down or getting rid of them somehow would have done it too you don't even have to trade it out yeah It, it just i don't know it bums me out yeah and then, yeah, but then it's just, when it gets going, it gets going, though. That last half hour, whatever it is, last last third was great. I mean, that's all I really had, too. Yeah, you, you put it better than I could. So, do you have anything else? Oh, man. Um, I, you know, the... I feel like there's a missed opportunity in the romance angle. Um, I don't really know what what a different way to go about this would be off the top of my head, but Bruce's character gets set up kind of seemingly as like the lead of the movie. He's sort of the this handsome dude. He disappears into the movie right like we he he matters absolutely zero to the progression of the plot so i think that there's just a there's a flaw in in even almost in almost even having him uh in yeah. a way like i like that that we are almost turning the tables on the who is who is important in the relationship kind of typical trope right typically the woman just becomes this two dimensional of uh, in this era well actually in in all films a lot of the time uh <laughs> sadly but you know like two dimensionalizing the woman is such a common thing and they kind of don't they do the opposite in this like he starts off seemingly as an interesting potential person of interest i guess i don't know but he he just fizzles into the background like he doesn't do anything he doesn't have anything to do with the result of the movie at all he doesn't even solve the mystery like he does nothing he just agrees with the commissario and like is supportive of his girlfriend that's nice He's just kind of going around being like, I'm the young, handsome love interest. Uh, Yeah. Right. Like, I feel like they just didn't know what to do. Like, for all we know, in the short story, he's he's like a nothing character. But they were like, well, we got to have a leading man. I mean, he's set up that way. Our intro scene. Yeah, you're right. right, And just really fizzles out. Which makes me think that that intro, like that, that's all a construction that has nothing to do with the short story. Yeah. 
And then they just didn't bother seeing it through that change of like, okay, what do we actually do with our leading man? We had well, he to doesn't, just insert. It's not even like, you know, if you're going to fall in line with the common story kind of tropes of the time, like he doesn't even come to like his girlfriend's rescue at any point. Yeah. Right. Like, it's not like he does nothing. And so to me, I, I just think it's, it's the other thing that really, look, I'm not saying you need a, a, a hero leading man thing to exist. I'm not saying that. I, I don't think that's necessary. But either do, either get rid of him or do something with him. Otherwise, you get this thing that we get, which is flat and middling. We don't even see him like form some sort of like necessary bond with the commissario in the end because he lost his girlfriend because he messed up or like had a different opinion than her you know like none of that like you could kind of cast a blank of this if you wanted like you could find a way to have this inter the interpersonal relationship stuff kind of devolve because of the experience of this delusional dude and it's just too much and it falls apart. Like something, just something else to make us feel like these characters just don't kind of like disappear. Well, it's, you're kind of touching on two sides of it and they do intersect, but it's as far as the romance story and as well as just him having agency yeah. in the actual story itself of the mystery. And when you're talking about the romance side of it, I mean, maybe it's kind of a combination of things that's maybe making it not click like where it's not at the level of like, what was it? Was it the, the, the early Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the 31 one we watched, there was like some older movie where I actually found myself getting caught up in the romance in a way. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but this one, where it just kind of starts from the get-go, where they're like the classic star-crossed lovers and just like, I don't know, it it's 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 hokey in the not kind of working way if you actually are trying to get, you know, feel sympathy toward their romance in a way that the black cat is. But what those characters are being used for in the black cat, whether it's intentional or not, they're like the MacGuffins. Like they're clearly like right. they're intentionally used as like here we think we're having our kind of classic couples leading man in, you know, and we're kind of with them. But then the story just it's really just a handoff. It's actually Bell Lugosi was <laughs> showing up on the train with them, you know. Right, right. But yeah, this I mean, one, I, it doesn't have that, it doesn't no. work off of that. It just and, like it's that in a bad way trying to figure out like what do you do like what what should you be doing or could you be doing with this setup as it is and one of the things that that it just is sorely sorely lacking if you are going to have this romance that's kind of like the whole romance is revolves around them not being able to be together right so there's a built-in conflict there. But then he just sort of go when 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 they can go off together, she says no, I'm going to stay. So you would think, okay, progressive conflict. <laughs> right? Like she she had an opportunity to go along with him and and leave. The thing that he's been asking for this whole time or wanting or and the thing that she's presumably been wanting but couldn't. Mm. And then she chooses to stay when she can leave. That should evoke an actual conflict between them. Mm -hmm. And we never see it. We never get there. So I think the way you would, at least in a modern sense, the way you would want to weave that in is to have them become at odds and have the relationship start to splinter so that everything's falling apart. People are dying. Like he then has something that he wants to actually like exert like some opinion that he wants to exert. He, he could be banished. I mean, she could be like, well, get out of here then. Like we're, we're done. Like at least that would be something that puts her more vulnerable because they're, she's just, she's on an island suddenly and there's still a killer on the loose or a hand on the loose, I guess, mm -hmm. 
you know, like it gives them some sort of impetus to fight for something rather than just standing around and being like, well, I wonder who's going to die next. Uh, I think you're spot on there because especially with that setup that we have where it's just from the get go. I love you. I love you. We have to run away together. Like, yeah, make that then. Then that's the where you got to mine your conflict from. Make it right. more than just because there's a hand going around. But yeah, make make them uh, start to fall apart and have to work yeah. at it, whatever. But oh, well, that's why it's just going to stay a rent for me. Yeah. Not bad, though. Not no, a bad thing. No, not bad. Great. All right. That's kind of all I had. You ready to move on to our next section? Yes. All right. Here we go. Wrap it up with Things of Note. Things of Note! <laughs> this should be interesting. I thought this was pretty interesting. This film was Warner Brothers' only foray into the horror genre in the 1940s, according to Wikipedia with a citation needed. Um, (laughs) But I will say that uh, when the Warner Brothers logo and theme came up at the beginning with it, it felt like... Yeah, I don't know, somewhat out of place. Like usually I don't know. There's there's certain when you're watching movies from this time when a certain logo or studio logo and and um j- whatever they're called theme jingle comes on with it, you're like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's one of these things these before here we are." But this one I just it did strike me as like, "Oh, I don't this is not familiar to have the Warner Brothers thing come up beforehand." So yeah. I I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then um, <laughs> I can't tell if you had anything, but just the last little thing I had, I mean, not a big thing. We're already kind of running down the list of, uh, you know, uh, uh, not uh, not spoofs, but, you know, you're mentioning Clue and other films. Like, what are the other films that are doing this thing? I mean, the clearest modern example for me was just Knives Out, like yeah. through and through. Like, it's everywhere. And this movie is everywhere in that movie like down to even i caught myself when saying it the old rich man who's leaving all his money behind his beloved uh you know a women caretaker like (laughs) it's all right there sure is the old the house everything yeah it's cool yeah it'd be fun if they're doing if ryan johnson is doing two which he is doing the two more knives outs what if for the you know, I don't know. It'd be fun if he, there was a, a more Halloweeny one with a horror bent, where it doesn't have. It's the kind of thing that we question if it's supernatural or whatever, like a severed hand <laughs> killing people. But of course, in the end, it's it's not. But I don't know. It could be fun if you know he's doing three of them. He's kind of have to mix them up somehow. Yeah, that's cool. That would be interesting if he just went, you know, full full on Scooby Doo, <laughs> full on Beast with five fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, and anything else you had? No, I tried to find the stunt person, but it's just, it's just, I don't even, you know, it's, it was probably some crew member. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I know I was checking the opening credits here, but I think it was before they listed that kind of thing. But, oh, but yeah. I did get confirmation. There was a card at the beginning. This is what I was thinking of. It says, this is the story of what happened or seemed to happen in the small Italian village of San, Se- Stef- San Stefano nearly 50 years ago oh okay but i was also turn of the century yeah but no uh no stunts credits here i mean is it just him did they just load up that guy with (laughs) a bunch of padding and push him down the stairs i hope not because that dude was not young (laughs) yeah i have to see the shot again we'll pick it apart (laughs) so good you know, there's some old enthusiast on these kinds of movies who could probably point us the right direction. Who's still around somewhere in the oh, in the halls in the halls of Burbank somewhere? You know, <laughs> right? We'll track him down. Um, cool, great. All right. Well, then, if that's it for the Beast with Five, fi- five Fingers, we can wind down with some recommendations. Um. 
I watched a movie last night called The Night House. You heard about this? Yeah. With what's her face? <laughs> yes, exactly. With what's her face? Rebecca Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't look up actually who made it or anything. Um, I saw in the credits that my boy David S. Goyer was a producer on it. Oh no, but I um, know it. I I know it was a wide release. I saw the posters around town. Yeah, it's out yeah. now. You could watch it at home. Director was this dude David Bruckner. Uh, he's uh he did the Signal. I think I watched the Signal. I'm pretty sure I did. Um, and VHS, it was presumably one of the anthology films in VHS. So you know, a horror guy. Um, it's good. Like, it's super creepy, and um, it's got a it's got a very fun. Uh, what the hell's going on? But you're given just enough to kind of, you know, not feel, <laughs> not feel super lost. You know, it's got a lot of like, oh, it could be this, and it could be that, and it could be that. We don't know, but we're gonna find out. It's did good. you did you rent it? I rented it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we watched the trailer and then we're like, okay, this this looks worth this whatever it was five dollars or something like that. Great. Yeah, I see it's to rent here. I'll check it out. Yeah. No, I I know it was getting kind of good word of mouth when it came out. It's good to hear your that come yeah. from you too. So go watch it if you get an opportunity. Cool. I'll recommend Dead. Just, you know, I'm just kind of going through what did I watch here this month? I mentioned I watched all the Final Destinations. I mentioned, I think, very passingly, I watched House of Wax, the remake, <laughs> um, which I almost recommended. Um, Ginger Snaps, I re- think I recommended it last week. But on October 26th, I watched the original Dark Water. You know, I got a be up on my j horror here you know from the director hideo nakata who did the original ringu ringu 2 all that stuff mm-hmm. or he did the ring it was great tim dark water okay. it's really cool I i've seen it. the remake the yeah. american i remember remake. seeing the remake when it came out in theaters um but it was just right at that level where the I feel like the remake for me, the mystery by the end kind of overtook the horror aspects in a way that, you know, doesn't work for me when mm-hmm. I'm signing up for a horror movie. But this one, like it had some scare moments and eeriness moments that I was if I had seen it before, I did not remember. But I was really surprised by it and were super effective. And it's just like the whole movie feels like dark water is the perfect title for it just wet sad rain yeah. grief ghosts in the midst yeah sad kids stuff uh yeah it was great check it out um yeah please do dark water from 2002 all right all right great and i believe uh so are we gonna pull a hat pull what are we gonna do oh no it's the sound our old friend the skull bike bell which means we are off to see a new release film. And like you, we are very excited to see the new Edgar Wright joint last night in Soho. Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I love Edgar Wright. Great. Me too. I have a who friend doesn't? who knows him, and I'm like so badly want to figure out a way to make that turn into me hanging out with Edgar Wright. Just got to keep making cool movies here, Tim. It'll happen. Yeah, yeah. That Uh, is true. Great. Well, I'll be very excited to see it and talk about it, as I said, as we all are. So cool. We'll be back next week with that. In the meantime, you can find us wherever you found us. We're at dismemberinghorror.com with all our links. We are a proud member of the Connected Family of Podcasts. Been saying it for a while. More on that later. Uh, we just record these so quickly and we're still ramping up with them. That's going to be a lot of what's going on. And we got some announcements about how they're helping us out and uh, some some ways we're going to shake up the show for the better. We're really excited about. So 
<laughs> continued to be more on that later. <laughs> hey, what are the odds that you could get Sixto to say hello on on mic right now? Is there any chance? Sixto. Oh, he doesn't have anything to say right now. <laughs> Well, someday, someday we did it that one time before. I forget which episode. Yeah, well, I think I think the the fans need more Sixto. Well, I won't disagree with you there. (laughs) He could be our little familiar walking around. There you go. Well, Tim, I gotta say it's these uh, kind of one what could feel like one off episodes that uh, you know they they aren't the big ones. Maybe they don't seem that famous, whatever. And I always kind of wonder, well, you know, how much are we going to have to talk about Dismember here? But I am always so surprised and not surprised, not that surprised. I have faith in us, but I'm always elated uh, all that we do have to Dismember. Hell yeah. In closing, then, uh, whether your beast has one, two, three, four or five fingers. Thanks for listening. Yeah, yeah, look out. Look out for those oh, those hands and we'll see you next time. Good Goodbye. <laughs>